governors. This is really sort of the catalyst for why we reached out. You've always been such a great resource when we ask you about things on the national political level. But it was something that transpired this week of a poll released about governors and governors' popularity that some news outlets picked up as a credible poll to which you uh, really took that to task and basically said, look, not all polls are created equal, and actually reporting some as credible when they're not may do more of a disservice to citizens and voters than not. So kind of go into that a little bit with us, Jennifer, if you will. Um, you see these all the time, but you know, as you said, we didn't report on it here. We've gotten the feedback about this poll. Again, this is uh, popularity, uh, approval ratings for governors. Uh, why did this not pass muster? Well, there are a couple of reasons it doesn't pass muster. And just so uh, we know what poll we're talking about, it was conducted by a group called Morning Consult. Um, so there are two reasons I, I, I don't love this poll. One, it is an internet-only poll, which means that you you know you take it online, you're contacted, and you you answer it online. And while it is an up-and-coming methodology, it is yet to be a scientifically proven methodology. You know, it's not embraced by uh, a group called APOR, which is uh, an organization of pollsters. Um, it just needs to be tested. Okay. Um, so what some groups are doing really is mixing it into their methodology. They'll do half by phone, some on the internet. But my biggest problem with this poll is that it's in the field for three months. So the survey dates were from the beginning of January through the end of March. What polls are really supposed to be are snapshots in time. Yes. Um, I think just, for example, watching this presidential administration, um, Things can change a lot in, in, in over the course of, of three months. So I'm really not sure that it is a fair representation of anybody's approval ratings. And what do you have to say? We talked about this, and you questioned the role of media. And, and we know, especially here in Rhode Island, there is a dearth of polling, polling data. You know, folks do want to know, especially politics being the way it is here, you know, we do hot or not every week, not scientific, but folks want to know, you know, how their elected officials are faring from an approval standpoint. So what is your take when media takes these types of polls and gives them to the citizens and the voters as sort of being gospel with, again, not bringing into those facts that you just mentioned? Right. Well, what I do think it's a disservice because, uh, you know, I think for voters, all, all, they believe all polls are somewhat equal. Um, and I can't blame them for that. You know, nobody really wants to become an expert, <laughs> expert on, on political <laughs> opinion research. But yes. the, the problem is that polling has gotten very expensive, mm -hmm. right? Getting, especially telephone polls. Getting a representative sample has become uh, expensive because it's harder to do, mostly because people hang up on pollsters. You know, the, the sort of advent of, of caller ID, of cell phones, um, which has upped the price. So people outside of the political parties and political campaigns really can't afford good, solid polling. So you kind of get what you get. Mm -hmm. In 2016, polling came under a lot of criticism. But the reality is the national polls were kind of pretty close to the popular vote. It was the state polls were horribly off. I uh -huh. mean, you know, Trump carried uh, Michigan, but of the 32 public polls released in that race, not one of them had, it not only didn't have them ahead, didn't even have them close. Ugh. So, you know, as I stand here in the media, um, you know, we talked about this poll, I reached out, and you said you didn't even want to comment on it. But of course, politicians, if they fare well in these polls, do want to sort of capitalize off it themselves. And again, you can't fault them for wanting to do so. But again, the average voter doesn't necessarily know what that number actually means. I mean, actually, so it is a bit of a disservice uh, to talk about this poll without you know, 10 or 12 caveats. Yes, the, you know, the political parties use it to their benefit. I know that Republicans kind of uh, took, a, took a shot yesterday at uh, any Democrat who was at the bottom of the pile in this poll. Um, you know, Republicans celebrated that of, of, you know, 
the 10 governors with the best approval ratings, they were all Republicans, but it, it really is meaningless. I mean, what I want to see is, is data from the parties and from the campaigns. Unfortunately, they don't like to release that. So <laughs> no. it, really does, it really does leave voters, you know, wondering where things do really stand. And I know I mentioned to you, uh, you know, we talk about politicians capitalizing on it. Again, this poll was reported on here. Uh, you know, the governor's office did speak to, again, from this data, a purported bump in approval. And I did want to talk with you again about sort of the governor at the larger level with all of the national press that she's been getting recently had a big piece in the New York Times that folks, you know, talk about back here. Obviously, a lot of discussion back in 16, uh, whether, you know, if, if Hillary had won, what her political future would be. But very much seems to be, again, even more so in the national conversation now, um, you know, I'm 2018 here, but a lot of folks talking about 2020. What's your sense of the role of Governor Raimondo? I mean, does this sort of groundswell appear to be having any true traction on the national level? Well, I think that when you talk about that, you, you need to remember a couple of things. One, of the 50 governors, there are only 16 Democrats. <laughs> um, it's a small, really it's small field. field. <laughs> they, they're kind of really behind the ball here. Um, as long as I, 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 there are only two Democratic women governors, uh, Romano and Governor Kate Brown of Oregon. So, you know, that makes for good press to be um, sort of a young Democratic female governor who came out of business. I mean, that's almost a unicorn. <laughs> they're just they're just very rare. Um, and so I think that that makes her, uh, you know, you know good print and good copy. And, and so that's what a lot of what you're seeing. What does that mean for 2020? Who knows? But one of the reasons I think that her name may come up is right now, the Democrats are kind of a party without a real leader, mm -hmm. you know, without a big national figure. Um, now that, you know, Clinton has stepped aside, Biden has stepped aside, Obama doesn't have that role anymore. So there's a bit of a void that people are trying to fill. Um, my least favorite question is to produce a list of possible candidates for <laughs> who know, oh, I mean, just so you know, Martin O'Malley will be in New Hampshire shortly. <laughs> so it, that it's, that you can tell us. <laughs> yeah. But it's but it's you know, it's kind of a long and dirty list right now. And folks and there are, and there are a decent number of women on it. Speaking of which, as folks point out, obviously close geographical proximity to an Elizabeth Warren. Where does Warren stand in the party right now? And you've got sort of two contrasting uh, Democratic women here with Senator Warren and, and Governor yeah. Raimondo. Um, you know, does that help or hurt them to have sort of two kind of elevated profiles of, of Democratic women who might be vying for a more visible spot within the party? Well, I mean, it's interesting. So. Warren really has carved out her niche as, um, you know, really sort of the leader of, you, you know, the progressives, right? The most liberal Democrats out there. She now interestingly has to share that with Bernie Sanders, <laughs> uh, which I don't think she counted on. But in the Senate, she is sort of considered um, the, the leader of the progressive bloc, which also includes um, Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, among others. Um, <clears throat> and so her national focus has been on electing more progressives, but she needs to win re-election in, in 2018. So she has kind of turned a little bit inward and is, is focusing at home. Does she run in, in 2020? Who knows? I, mean, I don't think anybody knows. But as, as you said, you don't have that little piece of paper just tethered to you with your little list there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, it's almost sort of starts to be committed to memory, but we're just going to see, you know, see what, what she does. But, I mean, there are a lot of people that don't think she is the right face for the, for the party. And I want to talk about, as you said, focusing on upcoming elections, because clearly, obviously, that's what Governor Raimondo is doing here with 18. We are clearly in cycle. 
She's already been endorsed by Emily's List. It came 20 months ahead of the election. But one of the things that we've discussed here, I've had uh, a number of political scientists from the colleges. I talked with Val Endress, sort of about this very issue, sort of the national press that the governor gets for, as you said, all of those unicorn-esque qualities of being a woman in business and a Democrat. But then contrasting that with local press here and a lot of very pressing issues, very difficult last few weeks, uh, months uh, dealing with the UHIP system here, uh, not being able to fix that quickly. It's not going to get fixed anytime soon. So what in your vantage point happens then to the average Rhode Island voter who sees sort of the glowing national press um, about things she's looking to accomplish here and getting the wheels in motion and then here sort of seeing where the rubber meets the road and some kind of major difficulties and some um, you know, some uh, some trying times for the governor's office. How, how do you rectify the two? Well, I mean, it, it is sort of interesting that, that there is um, there is sort of a glaring difference between her national press and, and her press at home. Um, but look, I watch governors in 50 states, and Romano's not alone in, in, in the fact that she um, gets criticized widely for everything that goes wrong and doesn't get too much credit for what goes right. Okay. okay. Um, there's also going to be a portion of the electorate who are always going to be Romano haters. They will never forgive her for pension reform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that, uh, you know, you sort of have to have to accept that. But when you have a more national view, when I look what's going on in Illinois um, and knowing you know, that could have been Rhode Island's future uh, had there not been pension reform. You know, at the end of the day, the state is, is better off, but there were people who will never accept that. So I'm glad I wanted to talk with you again about these polls as we had kind of gone back and forth yesterday about it. did want to talk with you about the national picture, but how can I not talk about what's going on in the Trump administration and especially what happened yesterday? We've had I believe just about 24 hours now to fully digest um, and, and obviously Sean Spicer trying to backtrack from his comments and you made the interesting point earlier about you know polls being done in a three month span and how things can change in three hours or three days not even on the, on the Trump administration you're down there what happens now well and the interesting thing about you know polling the president is that Gallup does it every day so we have <laughs> three-day moving averages of his approval rating, so we kind of know where it is. We know he didn't get much of a bounce uh, for his missile strike in Syria. Um, if anything, it sort of steadied him in the in the low 40s as opposed to dropping down into the 30s. Um, I have to say, watching this administration every day is an adventure. <laughs> you never <laughs> quite know what's going to happen. Um, but it also means that, generally speaking, you move on from topics pretty quickly. I mean, yes. I'll, I, I'm pretty sure that Pepsi and United Airlines sent uh, Sean Spicer <laughs> flowers yesterday, um, or cigars, or whatever uh, whatever he likes, um, to thank you for moving the needle off their own problems. Yes. You know, you woke up this morning to a headline in the Washington Post that said that um, the government actually got a visa warrant, um, which is a secret or to yes. uh, take the conversations of one of uh, Obama, of, I'm sorry, of Trump's campaign advisors last fall, mm. because there was some evidence that he was acting as a foreign agent. So that's today's story. So the you know the Russia, the whole Russia thing keeps getting weirder, and people have kind of moved on from Sean Spicer today. I think you are correct in terms of the news cycle. I mean, it very much again those the, the peaks and valleys. Uh, you know, being here and being in the industry, you know, we we see it all the time. I mean, clearly the, the focus and the fixation does, as you say, continue to be on just the role of Russia. But, um, you know, obviously big policy related uh, issues to be tackled uh, down in Congress, looking to see if the health care reform part two gets any traction or makes any movement. What's your sense of what might happen there? Well, I mean, it's very interesting that a couple of days ago, the president said that he wanted to do tax reform before he did, but went back to health care reform. And last night, he said the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't the premise of his big tax reform is supposed to be all these purported savings 
from dismantling Obamacare? I mean, do you have a, could you really put the cart before the horse? Well, well, I think that that's kind of the problem. I think you probably heard <laughs> yesterday that it was hard to do real tax reform without fixing health care. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I, I think he's dis he's discovered what we all knew was fixing health care reform is going to be hard. Repeal and replace was a great campaign slogan. However, really now it's more like repair. <laughs> And I think that there are a lot of Republicans who have to come around to that point of view. I think the leadership is already there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're going to have to get Trump on board with this. But the fact of the matter is that they don't have a lot of, I mean, if you, if you, they said that they wanted to accomplish both of these things by August, that isn't going to happen. They are going to come back from a two week recess um, and have three days to come up with something that keeps the federal government open for the rest of the fiscal year. Yes. <laughs> um, because at the end of the month, the money runs out. And they've sort of, uh, as always, put this off to the last minute. They're going to have three days to figure this out. Um, and then, I, you know, I talked with some folks yesterday. How big of an issue do you see uh, Trump and a full disclosure of his tax returns uh, being made public during this debate on tax reform, are the Democrats going to continue to push this issue? Democrats will never stop pushing this issue because it's very um, popular with their base, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> that, I, you know, I mean, this is uh, this is somebody who said he would release them if he got elected, and then you know, they they've been elected for what? two or three weeks when they said, yeah, no, maybe not. We're not going to do this. Um, you know, they, they quote, leaked some uh, pages that showed that he had eight some taxes over the last 20 years, but I don't think you're going to get much more. And I'm not sure that linking the tax reform debate to that is going to be ultimately very productive for Democrats. Well, again, we're keeping a close eye on all things happening down in D.C., and I do appreciate your Skyping in today as we helped set you up here for this Skype opportunity. Just to let folks know, again, outside in a broader perspective, when they hear things such as these poll numbers, which we went back and forth about, and again, again I really, uh, again, I keep going back to appreciate your coming in to explain to folks things to look at. All polls aren't created equal and to really what to qualify, what makes a good poll or not. I really, you know, breaking it down was very helpful. And I hope, I hope viewers got a sense of a, a little bit more, again, after getting this, this piece of information here. And Jennifer, I hope we can talk soon. Again, it's always great to be able to, to pick your brain on the, the national scene. And of course, with you knowing everything that's going on here in Rhode Island. So I appreciate it. We're going to let you off.